TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I am your friendly neighborhood philosopher, D. Wood, and with me now is the Assyrian Encyclopedia himself, Shameless Sham Shamoon. How you doing, Sam? Surviving by the grace and mercy and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. May increase in us, may we decrease, may he fill us with the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus and expose Islam. Have your way, Lord Jesus. We love you. We depend on you. We trust in you. That's how I'm doing. All right, Sam. Now, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've noticed this, but Muslims tell us that Islam is the religion of pure monotheism. Have you heard this? Have you heard these kinds of claims? Islam is this religion of pure monotheism, and yet <clears throat> I can't think of a religion that is more idolatrous yeah. than... Islam. Do you know what I'm talking about? 100%, my friend, even though they say not just monotheism, Unitarian monotheism, yet you'll see that they've deified Muhammad, elevated him to the status of their God, and that you have <clears throat> statements in the Quran that demonstrate Allah is not the only divine entity. You have the Spirit. The Quran is supposedly divine as well. So is Jesus. And then they kiss and smother a black stone and on and on it goes but hey mm -hmm. it's still pure unitarian monotheism just remember that yeah and uh r really i mean islam is is responsible for spreading more idolatry than any religion in history you could have uh very idolatrous religions and so on but but uh they don't have the impact that islam has had on the world simultaneously claiming to be the religion of pure monotheism while saturating everyone who enters this religion in complete idolatry, bowing down to a giant board cube, kissing a mm -hmm. pagan rock, performing all of these rituals and practices that were part of pagan worship before them, um, deifying a man and calling it pure monotheism. I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to an Evo here who says, hey, hello, David, today is my birthday. Happy birthday. An Amen. I do want to say something. Abhishek Infinity said, due to you guys, my Muslim friend lost faith. Due to the Holy Spirit <clears throat> using sinners like me and David Wood, mm -hmm. for the glory of Jesus Christ, he lost his faith. And may the Holy Spirit continue to use us to glorify Jesus and sanctify us and purify us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit gets the glory for anything we do that's good. Mm -hmm. Anything bad, wrong, or sinful, or imperfect, blame David Wood. He's mm -hmm. the cause. Uh, Azamat Bagatov said, why not expose other religions? Well, uh, as a Matt, uh, we tend to, I mean, I'll go ahead and give my view and Sam can give his. Uh, my view is when you have a religion that calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world, calls for terrorist attacks against uh, unbelievers, calls for the violent subjugation of my family, uh, a religion that says what you can do to my wife and my kids once you've uh, taken over uh, my area, um, when you have a religion like that, and it has 1.6 billion adherents, and it's growing rapidly due to birth rates, probably worthy of some attention here, right? And what other, what other religion is in that category? So tell us right. what tell us why we should be as concerned about other religions as we should about Islam. Uh, what are your thoughts 100%. on that, Sam? Why do you focus so much on? Yeah. Now, Sam, you actually deal with other groups. You deal with like yes, Jehovah's Witnesses and stuff like that. 100%. Why do you focus so much on Islam, though, over the years? Yeah. And I want to just 100% amen what David said. And for the record, <clears throat> I didn't go looking for Islam. Islam came looking for me. Yeah. Islam Allah started this. Yeah. Allah started 100%. with us. We didn't talk about yeah. Allah. Allah talked about us. Allah, yeah. I'm sitting here minding my own business, and Allah, 1,400 years ago, is saying, this guy's the worst of creatures. Surah 98, verse 6. You got to fight this guy. You got to subjugate this guy. You got to subjugate his entire family. You got to come. You got to you gotta kill him. You got to kill them all. You got to take their women captive. You got to rape them. You got to do all this stuff. You're sitting there saying all this stuff about me, and all I do is like, oh, oh, that's what you're saying? Oh, I'm going to respond to this. And then as soon as I do, people, why are you responding? My goodness. Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell, David, tell us how you really feel. No, but yes, historically, Islam picked the fight with Jews and Christians, and you're going to lose. When you come against King Jesus, the Son of God, who's risen, who's alive, and you come against his church, you will lose because Jesus is almighty. He is the Lord of all creation, and Jesus loves his church, and he'll protect his church by his spirit. So anyone who makes the stupid mistake of attacking the church of Jesus Christ— blaspheming the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ, the Father, Son. You better believe Jesus, who's on the throne, 
will quicken his soldiers by the power of the Holy Spirit to then engage the battle with the weapons of the Spirit, which are indestructible, to destroy all lies and falsehood and blasphemy set up against the Lord Jesus and his beloved church, his body, his spiritual bride. That's what happened with me in my <clears throat> early Christian days when I had just come back to the faith. I had a friend who was a Muslim, and we had some pleasant discussions because at that time, and I don't want to make it longer than necessary to show you why I do what I do. My friend was a boxer. His dad was a professional boxing coach. He trained a professional heavyweight boxer. I forget his name. It wasn't that famous, but anyway. And I used to be into bodybuilding, kickboxing, so he'd help me with my boxing, and I'd help him with bodybuilding. So we started talking about the Christian faith very lovingly, respectfully, because I love the guy. He was one of my best friends. His name, I won't give his name, but he was Bosnian. And he started falling in love with Jesus. So the Muslims found out. They came and started attacking the Bible, pointing to alleged contradictions, and they brought in the big guns, a Muslim apologist who had no mercy on me. He wasn't pleasant. He wasn't loving. He wasn't kind. He just humiliated me, talked down to me very condescendingly and mocked the child God, which actually accounts for why I'm so harsh with Muslims. Because my introduction to Muslims <clears throat> wasn't pleasant. I didn't meet someone who try to contextualize Islam, make it appealing to Western consumption, someone who just showed how much he hated the God of the Bible and hated Christians, and voila, he created a monster. A good-looking monster, but a monster nonetheless. And as long as Jesus gives me breath and life and health to love him, and the same as David Wood, I will not stop exposing Islam and any other group that sets itself against the triune God till I die or until Jesus comes. Yeah, um, Sam, it's it's amazing how Islam keeps creating us monsters and then whining about us after creating right. us, right? Because because me, um, guys, keep in mind, I'm a, you all know this, I'm a diagnosed psychopath. I don't have, I don't, I don't, I don't have any natural empathy towards people. So, I just. I'm completely capable of just dialing it up to 10 whenever whenever uh whenever I I'm challenged. Since I became a Christian, I've tried to I've tried to sort of be careful because I know if I'm aware that I could just dial it up to 10 um instantly without 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 real provocation or anything like that, then I have to sort of pay attention to what I'm doing and have self-control. Uh but when you've got a prophet who did all the kinds of things that Muhammad did, I, I, I really, really see no reason to be nice or gentle when discussing Muhammad. It's for the sake of Muslims that I'm trying to interact with that I would, you know, be gentle in my presentation. But these same uh, Muslims that I'm interacting with uh, start saying that they're going to, you know, kill my mother, rape my wife. Uh, they can't wait until they can kill me and so on. They tell me all the different ways they're going to kill me, all the different things they do. Um, they talk about, you know, Nabil dying. They say seeking Jesus, finding cancer and stuff like that. Exactly. And then they say, but be nice about our prophet when you talk about him. And yeah. guys, all I can say is no, right? You, you, you guys are the ones who changed my approach here, right? I was, I'm completely, I'm completely happy going through your claims and responding to them calmly and gently, right? But when if you guys are going to be extremely nasty and your prophet is the one who's responsible for this because that's that's the sort of behavior he encourages, I'm not going to just not going to be nice with your prophet. I'm going to I'm going to talk how I, I'm going to talk how I feel like talking about him. And so I'm just going to let it all hang out. And here's here's what's amazing, Sam. Here's what they do not get. All this stuff. All this stuff that I'm coming out with, just blasting away at the foundations of their religion. Them freaking out and crying, oh, we can't, we can't handle it. I still haven't really dialed it all the way up. I'm at like 60% here. Like 50, I'm at like 50 to 60% here, guys. I can, oh yep, man, they, there yet. they have no idea what's coming, man. They have no idea what's coming, Sam. And I want to add something. Had I been exposed perhaps to the Western contextualized version of Islam, the Islam presented by a Hamza Yusuf or perhaps even a Yasser Qadi, I may have been duped and deceived into considering Islam, and then it may have taken taken longer for me to then discover the truth of who Jesus is by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then I would have been doing this much later. So in one way, I thank the Lord Jesus, thank the risen Lord of glory, that he saved me that pain and misery of embracing a religion for years until finally coming to my senses by the Spirit and leaving it, 
by introducing me to a Muslim who hated the Jesus of the Bible, who hated his followers and hated the Bible, because that created, because one thing David has said, and it's true with me, I don't like to be pushed around, I don't like to be challenged, I don't like to be threatened, I don't take that lightly. I just something in my nature, maybe because like he said, I got mental issues, I was dropped as a baby, which I was, when I was a year old, I, I was dropped on my head. There's something when you challenge me, the beast in me arises. And I don't like that. I do not like to be challenged. Maybe it's my ego, but thank God he sanctified because when I got challenged, I was determined to seek the face of Jesus for answers. And here I am. And I learned that those Muslims who pretend to, pretend to be nice, is it's a facade. It's a facade. And they don't respect, and I'm going to be honest, effeminate, wishy-washy Christians, what the late Robert Moore used to call evangelifishes, they use you as useful idiots, as pawns, to accomplish their goal. They actually respect and fear you when you're bold as a lion and will tell them like it is. That's why Muslims can't get enough of David Wood. Even during Ramadan, they watch his... his <laughs> That's all they do. Right. Matter of fact, matter of fact, that's the comment here. World Changer says, "Why Ramadan advertisements on D Woods channel?" <laughs> Lol. Right. That's right. Why are they putting Ramadan advertisements on my channel? They're putting Ramadan advertisements on my channel because the YouTube algorithm is looking at what Muslims are watching and then giving them Islamic advertisements because that's what they're watching. They're watching my stuff. They sit around, they gorge themselves with food, and then they watch my videos until they fall asleep. And then they wake up and they gorge themselves and they watch my videos until they fall asleep. And so, now, uh, can I ask you something, David? That's that because I, I put on my video and a Ramadan commercial came out. That's what it means? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't know. See, I don't know how it works. I don't know how. Yeah, there, there is. I, a... I played my video and the Ramadan commercial came out. I said, why are they advertising Islam on my YouTube channel? Yeah, there is. That. There is a. Yeah, there's an out. Al the algorithm. Uh, right. The algorithm is looking for who's watching which channels and so on. And so if we deal with Islamic topics and Muslims come watching, then YouTube, the algorithm says, let's put ads on this channel. Because that's wow. where that's where the Muslims are watching. Oh, so uh, so so here here we had this uh, this uh, the comment that Sam already read by uh, Abishek. Due to you guys, my Muslim friend lost faith. That's happening a lot. I posted a video, I think around midnight or something. It was it was a Muslim who earlier in the day I'd seen his comment earlier in the day. I don't see most comments, but I'd seen his comment that Islam is the greatest religion in the world. Seven hours later, this guy's saying I, I'm I'm ashamed of my name and I, I can't follow this religion anymore. Right? Seven hours. Right? So this is happening pretty regularly. Now, Halim, based on the title here, Halim says uh, I don't know if he's saying this uh, as a Muslim or a Christian or what. Uh, Halim says this is very funny because it sounds like pure accusatory inversion. So. Muslims accuse us of uh, of having Jesus as our God, and therefore we're just reversing it. But Jesus is God, according to Christianity. Yes. Muhammad is supposedly just a prophet in, in Islam, and yet the more you study it, the more you find out that he is the real God of Islam, and Allah is basically his sock puppet. And what's, <laughs> what's amazing is that Muslims confirm this by deifying Muhammad regularly. And we wanted to get to that. However, there is one little side issue I wanted to cover here before we go into the topic because, Sam, how many yes, times sir. have we seen this? We say, here's the topic we want to cover, and Muslims start talking about a bunch of other topics. Are you familiar with this? What is that? Mm. Of course, this just comes out of the playbook of Muhammad. That's typical <clears throat> what they do. Haven't they been doing that in the previous sessions? That anytime we have a topic sign, it's like... Satan just then pricks them to bring topics up irrelevant to the issue you want to address in order to distract us. But yeah, that's that's a playbook out of Islam. Yeah. So yeah. What's, and what's what is it? Then? What is and it? and I'm, you I'm, can I'm you 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 even see this in conversations, right? A Muslim will ask you a will 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 throw out a challenge or ask a question. He'll say, "Well, Jesus is God. Uh, why did he pray?" And as soon as you start answering, he says, "Well, well, how can God die?" And as soon as you start answering that, they go, "Well, the Trinity doesn't make sense." And as soon as you start answering that, they go, "Well, Jesus died for your sins. You can just sin all you want." And you start answering that, they go, "But the Bible's been corrupted, right?" They they're not actually they're not actually looking for an answer. They're mm -hmm. trying to stump you. And so, anytime you are answering a question, they want to bring up a different topic because they they really aren't they really don't want to hear anything that anyone has to say on any topic. Islam has all the answers and and they don't need to hear anything else about anything. Um uh so anyway, I put I posted this as the topic and then I was updating some info and I saw the chat and Muslims were in there saying that we're wrong about Aisha. 
that Aisha had reached Jeez. puberty. We're Shut all up. wrong. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk about, we are going to focus on uh, some examples, and we'll probably carry this on till tomorrow because there's so much to cover here with, with Muslims deifying Muhammad. But uh, we, we want to get to that. But but very quickly, I told the Muslim, I said, look, I don't want to I don't want to refute you here in the chat where 10 people are going to see it because that's, you know, it's probably 10 or 15 people in the chat at that time. I said, I don't want to refute you here. I'd rather refute you live when there are a bunch of people watching. So let's go ahead and take a look at those comments. It's on it's on Muhammad and Aisha yet again. All right. So uh, he was claiming that Aisha had reached puberty. So oh, let me get Halim's comment off here. So Mo said. And I don't know if he's here in the chat, but I told him we'd be live. Oh, please. Mo oh, said, please. according to the definition of a child, it is someone who hasn't reached puberty. Aisha did. So he was saying that Aisha wasn't a child because uh, once you've reached puberty, you're no longer a child. And Aisha had reached puberty yeah. and therefore was not a child. Now, I went ahead and uh, posted, a, posted a comment. I said, well... Mo is claiming that Aisha had reached puberty. Apparently, he's never read the Quran or Hadith. Get the facts here, everyone. And so I go through Surah 65, verse 4, and the Muslim commentaries on it, and uh, how the, uh, how the even, even in collections like Bukhari, they tie this command in Surah 65, verse 4, which says you can marry, divorce, marry, have sex with, and divorce girls all before they've reached the age of puberty. So I put that, th that's in the video. And, uh, yeah, well, that and you've got the Hadiths, which talk about uh, Muhammad having sex with a prepubescent girl. All right. So that's in the video. Now, Mo responded. Um, well, first he responded, well, if you read the Hadiths carefully, then you'll see. Then you'll see that Aisha had reached puberty, according to the Hadiths. This is the example he gave. Now, Sam, have you ever heard this before? No. Narrated, narrated Aisha. I had seen my parents following Islam since I attained the age of reason, i.e. puberty. Not a day passed, but the Prophet visited us both in the mornings and evenings. And notice everyone, notice the little 25 in brackets. Notice the 25 there in brackets. Why is, uh, why is Mo got a 25 in brackets after this quotation? Well, all you have to do is cut and paste this to find out where he's getting it from. Um, mm -hmm. he, he forgot to edit that out. So he's not actually getting this from looking it up in, in Bukhari or anything else. He cut and pasted this from uh, the Yakin Institute's website, right? That, and if you go there and they've got this and they've got in brackets 25 there because they've got a footnote after this. And so he's simply cutting and pasting claims from the Yakin Institute website. Now, here's the thing, Sam. Mm -hmm. When a Muslim in the chat, in the comments tells me, Oh, Aisha had reached puberty. Here's a hadith that shows it. I do not assume that this Muslim is trying to deceive people because this is what they hear from their apologists and they think that they're getting reliable information from their apologists. So they think that this is saying that Aisha had reached puberty um, before she before she was taken to Muhammad's uh, house to, yeah. to consummate the marriage. But the Yakin Institute, they know better. They know what this hadith actually says. They know the Arabic. They know that this has nothing to do with Aisha reaching puberty. They know it. They know it. They know it. They are deliberately, deliberately mistranslating this passage, yes. misrepresenting this 100%. passage in order to deceive people like Mo so that Mo goes out and then he defends Aisha. And what they're hoping is that Mo will be able to deceive a bunch of people. He'll do the footwork for them and that he won't run into people like us who will actually break down the passage and, and expose right. the Akeen Institute for deliberately misrepresenting and distorting this passage. Now, Sam, this this yes. this passage from, from Bukhari here. Yes. If you if you go if you go to the available editions of Bukhari, they don't put puberty in in brackets here like they do here. That's what I was really taken aback by yeah. what you just cited. Yeah, a, yeah. They they, they they just say uh, since I had attained the age of of puberty, yes, right? The Akeen Institute knows that it doesn't say anything about puberty there, so they put they put puberty in brackets and they say the age of reason, and they're saying that yeah. the age of reason is puberty. So they're trying to fix the mess that's created by a mistranslation. But there are going to be some problems here. What is this actually saying? Is this saying I should reach puberty? No. Now, thank the Lord Jesus Christ that God has blessed us with the Internet, with all these resources free of charge. If you go to Answering Islam blog, 
dot wordpress dot com answering islam blog dot wordpress dot com i actually wrote a response to this it's called muhammad's marriage to a pre bubescent minor so do a search muhammad's marriage minor this is going to pop up now again i don't know why <clears throat> muhammad muskan khan translated this particular hadith or the arabic wording since i attained the age of puberty because just read the context it's not talking about puberty mm -hmm. it's talking about aisha reaching the age of cognition, meaning she now becomes aware of her circumstances and environment. She's aware. And we all know this, yep. right? Up until a certain age, we can't recall. Do you recall yep. when your mother changed your diaper? When she No, you don't. But there's a certain age, maybe five or six or seven. Now you, you have awareness. You have yep. cognition. So it, the Arabic does not say, I attained the age of puberty. In fact, here, you don't need to read Arabic to confirm what I'm about to say. It's in the article, but... You can find an alternate translation of Bukhari done by Aisha a Buley. convert to Islam, Aisha Buli. It's the Sahih collection of Al Bukhari. It's online for free. I recommend you find it, download it, because I don't know how long she's going to have it up there. Same narration, same hadith. I'm going to read her translation. So you see what it's saying here. Here it is. In her translation, it's number 464, different numbering. It is related that Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, said, I have no recollection of my parents doing anything but following the deen of Islam. That's all it says. The hadith is saying that as far back as she can remember, as far back as she can remember, she recalls that her parents were Muslim. That's all it's saying. And you don't need to be a pubescent to remember, mm -hmm. right? I mean, th I mean, think about it. You can be five and six and remember things, seven and eight or remember things. It has nothing to do with attaining puberty. It has to do with reaching the age of cognition where you become aware, you're fully aware of your surroundings. Oh, that's my mom and dad. Oh, I'm Aisha, right? That's all it's saying, that as far as she could remember, when she reached the age where she could recall things, she doesn't remember a time where her parents were not Muslims. That's all it's saying. And that's confirmed by the very next hadith that follows up this one. The very next hadith in Muskhan Khan's translation. So in the, in, very in, next one. In, the, in, the same, in the same volume of Bukhari that Muslims go to, to show in their attempt to show that Aisha had reached the age of puberty, you're telling us then that if they simply read the very next hadith, it would clarify this meaning and how it was mistranslated as having something to do with puberty? If they simply read the next one and therefore yes. that any Muslim who actually has read the passage knows that this is let alone muslims who can read in the arabic and see that it has yeah. nothing like we actually we actually had this on when christian prince was on here was he's this is not saying it's not saying anything about puberty here right yes um okay. but uh you're saying that if they simply went even for those who don't speak arabic if they simply read the next hadith they'd see what this yes. is about yeah well let me qualify when i said read the narration that has aisha recounting the past sorry about that i misspoke and i'm again no, forgive me for that what i'm saying is if you just read Another narration by Muhammad okay. Muskhan Khan talking about Aisha recalling mm -hmm. how long her parents were Muslims because oh, yeah. that's mm -hmm. the context, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the context. So again, let me just rephrase that again. Sorry about that. Sometimes I do misspeak even though I'm the closest thing to infallibility. In fact, I was going to uh, nominate myself the Protestant Pope and you'd be my cardinal. Is that okay? No, cool, just cool, cool. put that aside. <laughs> just putting aside. Guys, don't get upset. Don't stone me. Just kidding. All right. If you just read from Muhammad Muskhan Khan who translates another narration about the same incident. How far back did, did Aisha recall her parents being Muslims? How far back? Here it is. This is number 494 in the Muhammad Muskhan Khan translation. Narrated Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, since I reached the age when I could remember things. I have seen my parents worshiping according to the right faith of Islam. So that's the point. When you go to Bukhari and see what the context is, because this is narrated more than once, as even Muhammad Khan translates this, in other narration, and the context is the same. Aisha, how long do you recall your parents being Muslims? That's the context, David. Mm -hmm. How long do you recall them? And she goes, from way back when I was young, when I could remember and be aware of my surroundings, I don't recall them being other than Muslim. What does this got to do with puberty, uh, David? Help me understand. 
Nothing. So, uh, guys, do, do you all understand the, the point here? So notice, here you have um, Mo here, and we don't know if he's deliberately being deceptive or if he's just believing what his deceptive uh, scholars have said, but the, he's he, he cut and pasted this from the Akeen Institute article, and you can do the same thing. Type this in with, the, with that number 25 in brackets, where because that's one of their footnotes. Narrated Aisha, I had seen my parents following Islam since I attained the age of reason, i.e. puberty. They make the age of reason puberty, like you start being able to reason at puberty. Um, we know from other hadiths that say the same thing, and especially if you just read it in Arabic, or if you get a different translation, such as the translation of Aisha Buli, this is simply the age of when you can remember. Right. This is the age of, you know, if, if you, you you think back, as Sam pointed out, you, you can't remember things when you were a baby. You can't remember things when you were two. I think the earliest thing I remember, I remember breaking my I remember breaking this arm and I think I was about three years old. Uh, but you, you tend to only from the, the age of like three and four, you tend to only remember something that really stands out in your mind, something tra something traumatic. Um, but so what Aisha, all Aisha is saying here. As far back as I can remember, my parents were following Islam. Yep. That's it. That's right. As far back as I can remember. So from the time I was able to form memories that last until now, my parents were Muslim. And that's yeah. all it's saying. And notice Muslim websites and deceptive Muslim apologists have to twist this into a claim that she'd reach puberty by doing gymnastics on a passage that has nothing to do with her reaching puberty. That's right. Nothing at all. Yeah. And, and emphasize the fact, David, that even Muhammad Muskan Khan, when she, when he has, <clears throat> when there's another narration in the same collection of Bukhari, because I want people to get this, where you find the same narration mm -hmm. in another section of Bukhari, where Aisha again is talking about how far back does she remember her parents being Muslims, there he gets it right, mm -hmm. number 494. Don't forget, for some reason in this other one, <clears throat> He, he decides to translate it as attain the age of puberty, number 465. Mm -hmm. But in number 494, same context, same same point. Aisha, how long do you remember your parents being Muslims? Again, let me re re repeat. When I could remember things from the age when I start remembering things. And don't forget the point that Aisha Buli translates that same hadith that Muhammad Muskan Khan said, age of puberty. And notice how Buli translated because Arabic has nothing to do mm -hmm. with puberty. Here it is from Aisha Buli. Number 464, it is related that Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, said, I have no recollection of my parents doing anything but following the deen of Islam. Where do you find puberty? It has nothing to do with it. So I just want that to sink in. This is another desperate attempt of trying to excuse the behavior of Muhammad. But understand the implication of this, David. Mm -hmm. They see that it's morally evil. Yep, they know it. It is immor immoral for a grown man, 54-year-old man, to have sex with a prepubescent, premature minor. Mm -hmm. And they yet, so for some reason they think, let's argue, let me just, for argument's sake, let me just go with it, that at nine, she did attain puberty. And that's going to justify that a 54-year-old man, old enough to be her great-grandfather, to sleep with her and take her to his bed as his wife, even if she, for some strange reason, reason we assume, she was pubescent. That doesn't mean that psychologically or even physiologically she'd be able to be intimate with a grown man so that even that shows how sick this mind is to seek a justification for what a 54 year old man did uh -huh. to a nine-year-old playing with dolls and on swings yeah and uh just so everyone knows that they shouldn't be toying around with uh bukhari and trying to twist things into saying that aisha had reached puberty let me go ahead and put this up on the screen and as you do that, uh, we have another troll, Nadim Ahmed, saying that Mary was 12 years old when Joseph married her. See? Okay. Well, we, yeah, we can deal with that. Guys, guys, yeah. we're going live today and tomorrow. So if we need to push some of this off and, and, <laughs> and address the topic of Muhammad and Aisha over and over. Again, Sam. We're trying to we're trying to talk about some theological stuff here, and Muslims just want to keep talking about Aisha all day. Yeah. They don't <laughs> it's mind. amazing. You want us to shame Muhammad and expose him? What a pervert he is! Yeah, and, and sleeping with a minor. Up to you. And on top of that, show how they lie in response, and that their their responses are based on lies. That that they'll tell everyone, "Oh, we respect we respect Mary and Jesus and the prophets," and then they'll turn right around and lie about them in order to defend their own fake prophet. This is this is hilarious. All right, but everyone, so this is. 
This is the same translation of Sahih al-Bukhari that Muslims use to show that Aisha had reached puberty. So this is number 5133, but let's go up to the chapter heading here. Chapter heading, giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. One's young children, not just children, young children. Giving one's yeah. young children in marriage is permissible. Why? By virtue of the statement of Allah, and for those who have no monthly courses, i.e. they are still immature, so that's Surah 65, verse 4, that's the Quran. And it quotes it, and the idda for the girl before puberty is three months in the above verse. The idda for the girl when? Before puberty. Before right. puberty. Before awesome. puberty. <laughs> it's giving the it's giving the rules for divorcing a girl that you've married and had sex with all before the age of puberty. And then, as an example of this, he connects it to number 5133, narrated Aisha that the prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old, and then she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. Now, think about this. Uh, Muslim apologists go to a hadith that has absolutely indisputably nothing to do with puberty, right? It's it's Aisha saying, as long as I can remember my parents, uh, my parents were always Muslims. We know that because we have alternative translations and because we have other hadiths saying the exact same thing. It's the, they're telling the, they're telling, they're telling that they're, they're, they're relating the same account. Muslims talk about this and they say what, when Aisha says, you know, as far back as I can remember, she's talking about the age of reason. Oh, but the age of reason, we're going to say that means puberty. Therefore, she'd reach puberty. This is what they have to do. This is what they have to do in order to justify their profit. We're not done. Let me uh, let me go ahead and pull up something else from Bukhari right here. Number 6130, narrated Aisha, I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the prophet. That's strange because I, I thought that such images were forbidden and that girls weren't allowed to play with dolls in Islam because they're images. I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves, but the prophet would call them to join and play with me. The playing with the dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time, as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. So here we have over and over again. And by the way, if, if someone wants to say, no, that's talking about before Muhammad consummated the marriage with her. Uh, no, let's go ahead and read Sahih Muslim. It was narrated from Aisha that the prophet married her when she was seven years old and she was taken to him as a bride when she was nine years old and she took her dolls with her. He died when she was 18 years old. So when she was taken to Muhammad's house to consummate the marriage, she says that her dolls were with her. Now, now, ladies and gentlemen, keep in mind, why is she, talk, why is she talking about her dolls being with her? What, I mean, I'm sure she took all. I'm sure she took other things. I'm sure she took her clothes and things like that. Why is she talking about bringing her dolls with her? That's just Arabic slang for saying, and by the way, I hadn't reached puberty. I was still allowed to play with dolls at the time, so I hadn't reached puberty. That's how they would describe it. That's how, So that's how they would say that they, they had not reached puberty yet. I still had my dolls. So you have over and over again in Bukhari saying that Aisha had not reached puberty when Muhammad had sex with her. You have in the Quran itself, Allah is saying that you can marry a girl, have sex with her, divorce her, all before she's reached puberty. And to respond to this, Muslims will go to a hadith that doesn't have anything at all to do with Aisha reaching puberty. They'll twist it into meaning that. They'll ignore everything else and they'll say, you see here, your accusations are unfounded. Why? Because the Muslim apologists know that this is something that really bothers Muslims. Muslims find this behavior absolutely repulsive and they know people will leave Islam if they find out about Muhammad, the truth about Muhammad. And so they are deliberately deceiving and distorting. What kind of religion needs to rely on deception in order to prop it up? Islam. All right. What yeah. do we want to do, Sam? You know, this gentleman, again, Nadim, he's uh, lying uh, for okay. his teeth. Hang on, let me see if I thing. can find him. Yeah, if you find, I just want to say this man is, again, he's on the level of Osama Abdullah or Nadir Ahmed. Yeah, that's he, probably where he's, he's copying his stuff from. Yeah, because he's lying through his teeth. He, he said earlier that that's why the Monophysite Christians, the Miaphysites, are on the side of Muslims over against the Diophysites. For those of you who don't understand what that means, there are Christians like the Coptic Church that believe that Christ's humanity was engulfed by his deity in, this, in such a way that his humanity has become devonized so that 
they find it more appropriate to speak of Christ having one nature. That's in opposition to the view that most Christians hold the oppositeism, meaning that there are two natures in Christ. Now, because he's he's lying and he's following the example of his prophet, whose father was the father of lies and a murderer, because Muhammad was the son of Satan, it is not true that the Miaphysites are on the side of the Muslims in that the Miaphysites are Trinitarians. They believe the one God is the Father, his eternal Son, his Word that became flesh and eternal spirit, and they believe that Jesus is truly God, and they still affirm that he has a physical body in heaven. They don't deny that. So why would this wicked agent of the devil try to pit these Trinitarians against other Trinitarians where the, their disagreement has to do with whether the human nature of Christ has been divinized, what they call theosis, and therefore it's more appropriate to speak of Christ having one nature, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, believe it or not, we're both saying the same thing. And I'm not trying to make light of the differences and the schisms, but at the end of the day, if you ask a Coptic Christian, is Jesus still a man with a physical body that's immortalized? They'll say yes. They have to believe in the humanity of Christ because they believe in the Eucharist, the body and the blood becomes the body, the, I'm sorry, in the Eucharist, the bread and the wine becomes the body and blood of Christ. And yet this guy's such a wicked tool of the devil, he thinks he's going to get the Miaphysites right, on his side in order to put them against the Diophysites. But only someone who's inspired by the same devil that influenced Muhammad could be this low. And then to have the audacity to say, Joseph was 90 years old when he married the Blessed Mother of Lord at the age of 12. So I want to call him out. If he brought up the statement, I want this fraud who makes Muhammad look credible and honest, quote the source, give me the date of the source, give me the date of the reference, give me the document that mentions that Joseph was nine years old when Mary was betrothed to him at the age of 12. The reason why I say that, there are no authentic sources. There are no documents from the first century, from the eyewitnesses or the followers of the eyewitnesses that say that Joseph was 90. But even if we agree he's 90, this guy either is so demonized that he forgets Joseph didn't touch Mary. Mary conceived and gave birth to Jesus while a virgin. And if you're going to quote church history, then quote it in context by the time this source that you're alluding to. And this is what's ironic, David. The source he's alluding to, where Joseph is 90, was produced by people who believe that Mary remained a perpetual virgin so that what Joseph did wasn't marry her, but took her into his house to be her guardian. That's why they posted his age at 90. Let me explain to you why 90. Because they're trying to show that Joseph was too old to marry her, so that when he took her in, he took her in as a daughter, and he was a father figure to her. You moron. Anyway, go ahead, David. All right, well, we have uh, a response from Mo here. Uh, Sam, this is a problem. So we already know that Mo here has not read his sources. He simply cuts and pastes things from the Yakin Institute. And we've already shown that the Yakin Institute is a big bunch of liars who deliberately distort things. So should we expect this trend to continue? Let's check this out. So he tries to correct us. Now keep in mind, Sam, he's trying to correct people who've been through the passages, been through the, the, the commentaries, been through the hadiths, been through all of this stuff. He's never read any of it. He cuts and pastes and he's trying to prove us wrong, but he doesn't realize that in trying to prove us wrong, He's just done some really bad stuff to his own religion. Watch this. So this is Mo. He says in chapter 65, verse 4, it says Nisa, which means woman, not girl. Those who haven't menstruated are those with medical issues. So notice what he says here. When it talks about girls not reaching, or let's say he wants to say women who haven't reached, who, who don't have, who haven't menstruated. It's talking about ones who have medical problems, right? Not, not young girls. Okay, let's just go back. Let's go back to um, the hadith I quoted from Bukhari, because what we're going to see right here is Bukhari disagrees with him. All right, Bukhari, yeah. the greatest source on the life of Muhammad, according to Muslims themselves, yeah. the greatest hadith scholar of all time, according to Muslims themselves, what does he think that Surah 65 verse 4 means? Giving one's young children in marriage is permissible by virtue of the statement of Allah. And for those who have no monthly courses, i.e. they are still immature. That's so right. he thinks this refers to immaturity and he, he applies it. And the idda for the girl before puberty is three months, before puberty. So he says this means prepubescent. Mo says otherwise. So notice Mo here is already claiming 
to be a greater scholar of of the Muslim sources than Imam Bukhari. But it gets worse right. because that's that's not the only one. All right, so let me go ahead and relate and and read the Hilali Khan translation, which this is kind of an important yeah. translation in, in Islam, isn't it, Sam? The Hilali Khan. Yes. Right. Okay, yep. so how do how, how how does the Haleli Khan translation translate this? Surah 65, verse 4, Haleli Khan. And those of your women, as have passed the age of monthly courses, for them, the Idda, prescribed period, if you have doubt about their periods, is three months. And for those who have no courses, i.e. they are still immature, their Idda, prescribed period, is three months likewise, except in case of death. So, Haleli Khan, Haleli and Khan... In their translation of the Quran, uh, they say that this actually refers to a girl being immature, not to her having medical issues. Tafsir of Ibn Kathir, Ibn, Ibn Kathir, the uh, most uh, the most respected Quran commentator in history, Ibn Kathir. Here's his commentary on this: Allah the Exalted clarifies the waiting period of the woman in menopause, and that is the one whose menstruation has stopped due to her old age. Her idda is three months instead of the three monthly cycles for those who menstruate, which is based upon the ayah in Surat al-Baqarah. The same for the young who have not reached the years of menstruation. Their idda mm -hmm. is three months likewise, uh, three months like those in menopause. So Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir interprets this as girls being too young to have reached the age of menstruation. Tafsir Jalalain, one of the one of the most respected Muslim commentaries of all time. Here's his commentary, Bill their commentary. And as for those of your women who no longer expect to menstruate, if you have any doubts about their waiting period, their prescribed waiting period shall be three months. And also for those who have not yet menstruated because of their young age, their yeah. period shall also be three months. So Tafsir Jalalain also interprets this as applying to girls who simply haven't reached the age of puberty. All right, Tafsir of Ibn Abbas. Now notice, Sam, this is Ibn Abbas. This is Muhammad's cousin. He's right. a companion. He's a companion of Muhammad. He gives the actual historical background for when this was revealed. He gives the historical background. This is what happened as it's being revealed. What's he say? Tafsir of Ibn Abbas. And for such of your women as despair of menstruation because of old age, if you doubt about their waiting period, their period of waiting shall be three months. Upon which another man asked, O Messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young? Along right. with those who have it not because of young age, their, we their waiting period is three months. So according to Ibn Abbas, a companion of Muhammad, this this ver th this quotation about girls who don't have a, a, a monthly cycle, it's in response to a guy who raised his hand and asked a question, Muhammad, what about, you're, you're saying there's these different waiting periods for these different different uh, kinds of people and so on. Uh, what about girls who don't have a monthly cycle? How am I supposed to time it? The response is three months if she doesn't have a monthly cycle yet. So notice, you've got Bukhari, you've got Ibn Kathir, you've got the two Jalals, you've got Muhammad's companion, Ibn Abbas, all of them say what the Quran is saying there is that you have to wait three months to divorce a girl that, you ha that you've had sex with who hasn't reached puberty yet. She doesn't have monthly cycles because she hasn't reached puberty yet. All of them say that. They tie this to Aisha, who hadn't reached puberty in the comment, I mean, in, uh, in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. Mo comes along. He's never read any of this. He's never read anything in his life except an article on the Akin Institute. And he's saying, I, Mo, know better than all of my greatest scholars of all time. I do. That's right. I know better than all of them. I know better than all of them. You can combine all of them. I'm better than Ibn Kathir. I'm better than, I'm better than Ibn Abbas. The two Jalals yes. ain't got nothing on me. That's what he's telling That's us. Right. And he's expecting By us to way, believe him. Go ahead. By the way, David, just to correct it, if he knows Arabic, then he lied through his teeth and you have Arabic speakers here. Nisa, or, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, or he doesn't know Arabic and he's parroting because the word Nisa, and there's Arabic-speaking Christians. You just proved it, 65 verse 4. Mm -hmm. Nisa can mean women or it can be used wives. synonymously with the word uh, zawaj, meaning wife wives. and mm -hmm. your wives. We know contextually it has to be referring not to women but wives because it's talking about the waiting period of their divorce. That means it's not just any women. It is your wives in particular. So either he's a liar, because he knows Arabic, or an ignoramus. Either way, you're disqualified. Stop embarrassing your prophet. Leave it to the so-called experts to embarrass Muhammad for you. 
All right. So, um, guys, uh, th that's just what, what you just saw. That's the situation that we deal with all day long, right? It's, Sam, what, once again, in a weird way, we have more respect for the Muslim sources than Muslims have, right? 100%. Yep. We, try, we try to say what the Muslim sources are actually saying. We try to show what Muhammad is actually saying, what the sources actually say. But as fast as we are trying to say, here's what your source says, stop lying about it, they lie about it, right? Their greatest, their greatest scholars, their most popular people all lie about it. What an amazing, amazing religion. Yeah. And um, let me encourage them, by the way, David, you have videos on Aisha's age and you have posts on AnsweringMuslims.com. I'm posting one Guys, today. And then, by the way, just let you know, if you want the written material to use, I have nearly 12 articles, about 12, maybe even more, on AnsweringIslamBlog.wordpress.com just on the age of Aisha and whether Islam allows marriages with minors who haven't reached puberty, about 12, maybe more. Go search, study the materials, and someone is asking your permission. Can they take your videos and upload them to their YouTube channel? They're asking if they can do that. Yeah, they so, can. Yeah, they can. They can use all my videos. Although, all I, of our guys, stuff. I, I would, I would recommend just because I heard it from a uh, uh, from from a couple other people who have used my videos, and then they say they get uh, YouTube takes it down because they say it's 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 copying some someone else's stuff. Keep in mind, I've never, I don't flag any stuff, and I, I say it. You can always you can always appeal that if they take it down, you can say no, I have permission, and you could link back to yes. here. Everyone has permission to re-upload my stuff, uh, but just to avoid that, because I think it's some automated system that says this is the exact same video as this. You might want to change something, right? Make it a second longer, a second shorter, any sort of change so that it's not identified as the exact same video. I don't know that that will help, but it, it might. So, so yeah. try that, but yeah. Uh, all right. Take uh, our stuff and use it for the glory of Jesus. Expose Islam until Muslims are so ashamed of Muhammad, they have no choice but to leave this fraud and turn to Jesus Christ as their only hope of salvation. So go ahead. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, keep in mind, we, uh, we, you know, we, we come here with a topic. I understand that some people are, are you know, want us to, to jump on the topic. Again, we're, we're going live, Lord willing, today and tomorrow. So and the stuff. Let me answer this. I don't mean to cut you off. I want to answer this question for Reverend Dr. Chester R. Cook. Is six still permissible? Yes. In Islam, I have an article called Islam, the Religion of Pedophilia. There is no set age uh -huh. for a girl to be married off. So Reverend Chester, you know what the only condition is? The only condition. And I quote Muslim sources saying this. The only condition, Reverend Chester, is can the young girl handle penetration? If not, then take it easy on her until she's able to do so. That's the only condition. Islam, the religion of pedophilia. It's in my article where I document it from Muslim sources. This is a sick, wicked, demonic religion from the pit of hell. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go ahead and uh, uh, share this. So anyway, uh, guys, I was pointing out that I was pointing out that uh, we have a topic. Um, we have, but we have two days to address this topic, so we might, basically we wanted to get into an Adnan Rashid clip where he deified Muhammad, uh, and doesn't even realize it, but we've, we've still got plenty of time for that because we just wanted to take a look at that clip and show that Adnan Rashid, uh, and, and Muslims like him are deifying Muhammad and they, they just don't realize it. Uh, but since there are so many objections coming up, they're from, Sam, it's, it's from Muslims, right? <laughs> Every time we say we want to play clips of your apologists so that we can actually go through them and people can hear what they have to say and we can respond. I don't know. We want you to start smashing Muhammad to pieces. Yeah, he's one of the liars. Okay, yeah. I, yeah. guys, I'll, I'll 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 do it pretty much every time, right? I, I can I can I can be sitting here, guys. Here's what I want to talk about, and you're like, yeah, but you're not going to talk about Muhammad. I'll be, oh yeah, I will. I'll I'll do it. I'll do it. Every, I'll do it every time, right? But uh, ex Christian here is saying, why Christians get mad? They are scared from discussing the Bible. I watched Dr. Zakir Naik and I lost my faith from Zakir Naik, the biggest joke in the yeah, his, no. in history. You know this guy's a liar. Yeah, this you have to. Joke. Yeah, you have to be a special kind of dumb. I would be shocked if this is actually next Christian. Yeah. Sam, I don't know if you know this, but lots of Muslims will will just come on and you know they've been Muslim all their life, but they'll say I'm an ex-Christian. I was persuaded by Zakir Naik. You have to be a special kind of stupid to That's fall right. for the the claims of okay. Zakir Naik. But but Sam, occasionally I just go ahead and stop. I just stop what we're doing, and give a Muslim an opportunity. Uh, he says, I left Christianity and converted to Islam. All right, ex-Christian, tell us, give us the most powerful, the most powerful, because, you know, we can't go through all of Zakir Naik's stupid yeah, claims. Yeah. So just go with the best. Just go with the best. What is Zakir Naik's most powerful argument 
for Islam. What was, what's the, what's the, if you, if you, if, if, if Zucker Knight were with a person on a train and only had two or three minutes, what would his most powerful, most persuasive argument for Islam be? Go ahead and tell us what it is and, and, and we'll give yeah. you an opportunity to show all the Christians here what the powerful evidence was that convinced you yeah. that Islam is true. Keep in mind how generous and patient we're being. We're stopping what we wanted to do and saying, wow, if you have this awesome evidence, yeah. we're going to go ahead and let oh. everyone, everyone here. He got you, David. What did he, he say? He quoted, because this is a Zachariah argument, God rested on the seventh day. Does God whoa, 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 whoa. rest? Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, I asked him for, I asked him for his, his most powerful argument. Wait, wait, happy happy oh, to address that. Happy to address that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'd be happy to address to that. Yeah. But first, we want to address, you said you converted to Islam. Give us the most powerful, most persuasive argument for Islam, something that convinced you that Islam is true. Keep in mind, you can, you can abandon Christianity and say Christianity is dumb, how do you get to Islam then? Why would you convert to Islam after that? So what's the most powerful argument for Islam? We're going ahead and, and yes. pausing right here, giving you the opportunity to share your awesome argument, your awesome evidence with the people here so they can see so they can see why they too, why they too should convert to Islam. Yeah. Oh hang on. As you're well, waiting, oh I had I had I had any... no, I had one while we're waiting, but go ahead. No, I was gonna say, folks, Christians, I want you to hear what he just did. As we're waiting for his most powerful argument, I want you to thank ex-Christian for proving that Zechariah is a fraud and Muhammad is an ignoramus and a son of the devil. Why? Mm -hmm. Because if he's right about Genesis 2, his misinterpretation of Genesis 2 verse 3, that God had to rest because he got tired, that means Muhammad is an ignoramus, a moron, an idiot. I'm sorry, I have to be very direct in exposing this fraud for who he is, because Muhammad confirmed the Torah that the Jews and Christians possessed in his day, and he even said that Jesus confirmed the Torah that was between his hands. Yep. And we already did series on this. See, this is why we sound like broken records. We just finished, what, three, four, I think three sessions? I forget, man. I, we did so many, I forgot. Mm -hmm. Where we schooled Adnan Rashid in a shameless distortion of what the Quran says about the Bible. And we gave you plentiful proof from the Quran and the Hadith where Muhammad believed the Bible as you have it today, which is the Bible that the Jews and Christians had at Muhammad's time which is the same Old Testament that Jesus confirmed, right? Is the uncorrupt, preserved words of God. But guess what, folks? The Torah that Jesus confirmed, the Torah that Muhammad confirmed, contains Genesis 2 where it says God rested. And he just laughed at that saying, does your God need to rest? You just buried Muhammad in the pit of hell where he belongs and where he deserves to go, but for other reasons, because Muhammad wasn't as smart as you or Zachary and I, because Muhammad confirmed Genesis 2 to be the very Torah that God gave, the preserved word of God, Muhammad, you moron, didn't you know that God doesn't rest? How could you confirm that and have Jesus confirm that? Thank you for destroying Islam and convincing us to never follow Muhammad because you're smarter than Muhammad. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and leave that one up on the screen here for a while. Hope you understood the point, ex-Christian. The point, the point is your Quran and your prophet affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the scriptures that were in the hands of the Jews. Muhammad even pointed to a copy of the Torah that was brought to him by the Jews and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. And you, uh, you're you claiming that the that, that the Torah is stupid, that the, the book in the possession of Jews and Christians is stupid. Your prophet affirmed it. Your God affirmed it. So you just accused your God and your prophet of being stupid morons. You said that, not us. Right. All right. Now, the riddle fact, I'll go ahead and leave ex-Christian's uh, response up there because we're waiting for him to uh, give us his argument. Most, power, most powerful, most persuasive argument. Uh, but Riddle Factory said, in Spain, a Christian-dominated country, up until recently, age of consent was 13, and marriage age was 14, which has increased only a few years of age. Your comments. Uh, what, what do you think uh, What do you think about... Do you want me to comment, or you want to comment, Sam? Yeah, I mean, if you want to comment first, go ahead. I mean, uh, okay. anyway, go ahead, you comment. Okay, yeah, notice they, they always say this, right? They'll always say, ah, but here was... <laughs> here's a country where... <laughs> Now notice if if a Muslim no just think about this if someone suppose we were to suppose we were to conclude that all alcohol is bad and so the laws change and they said all alcohol is bad right and then if a Muslim said ah oh, but in this earlier century they allowed alcohol what does that have to do with anything right what does what would that have to do with anything right are you saying that Spain was right? In everything it did, and everything it decided, because alcohol is illegal in Spain. Well, alcohol was legal in Spain too. So are you saying that's right? Notice what he's saying. They did it, therefore there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, that's that's right. the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, yeah. But next, notice 
there's a huge difference between thir- uh, you know, 13 to 14 right. and 9. Someone who's, uh, we've pointed this out before, Muslims have this, b- because of Muhammad and because of Allah, they have this old enough to bleed, old enough to breed mentality. Namely, she's got her first period, we're ready to pounce on her. And that's what, that's what almost every Muslim says on the issue of Aisha. She reached puberty. She hadn't reached puberty. That's a lie. That's a lie. But they'll, they'll make some false claim based on a deceptively distorted and mistranslated hadith and say, oh, you see, she's reached puberty. Therefore, it's okay for our prophet to jump on her. He's over 50 years old. Right? What's the problem there? Well, puberty is a process that lasts a few years. Right? Puberty lasts a few years. During this, a, a, a girl doesn't just get her uh, first period, her first menstrual cycle, her body also transforms over a period of those years, right? So her hips widen, her birth canal widens, her body goes through all kinds of hormonal changes. Puberty takes a few years. The Muslim mentality is up, we'll jump on her as soon as she gets her first period. That, That first period does not mean she's done with puberty. So here, even if we went with Spain as the final authority, which is what Riddle Factory is trying to do, Spain is the final authority on all things. Okay. Someone who is 13 or 14 can be finishing puberty, can be completing puberty. A girl at nine years old might might have, it does happen occasionally, does occasionally reach puberty, but she hasn't completed puberty. You don't see fully grown nine-year-old girls. You just don't, right? Exactly. You do see 13, 14-year-old girls who are fully grown. You do see that, right? And besides that, notice, it's all irrelevant because Aisha had not reached puberty and the Quran does not require that a girl reach puberty. The Quran says it doesn't matter. You can marry a girl before she's reached puberty, have sex with her before she's reached puberty, divorce her before she's reached puberty, and pass her on to the next Muslim before she's reached puberty. That's the position of your God. So what in the name of common sense are you talking about 13 and 14 in Spain? And why would you be asking for our comments, Riddle Factory? You know what you know what you you know we destroy every ridiculous argument that comes out of your yes. mouth. Go ahead, Sam. Especially a 54-year-old man yeah. sleeping with a nine-year-old. But for the Christians here, <clears throat> I just want you to know, you may you may be shocked to hear this, and it may come as a surprise. You'll find the Bible presupposing that a young girl has to have reached a point beyond <clears throat> puberty for her to be even considered mature enough to be married. And I'll prove that to you. I've got articles on this, but I'm just going to give it to you. One quick one. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 36. Guys, pay attention to what Paul writes, and this is something taken as a given. One thing about the Bible, the Bible will often say things in passing without elaborating on it, because the writers assume that the people they're writing to already know the background, already know this. They take it as a given as common knowledge shared and agreed upon and accepted by the people they're writing to. So this is where you find these nuggets of biblical truth, where an inspired writer will mention something in passing without going into detail because he assumes that his audience already knows the background and this is common knowledge, that this is something they share in common. There is no dispute. There is no need to defend it. And you'll find God doing this in Ezekiel 16. But for the sake of brevity, Mm -hmm. here, 1 Corinthians 7, 36. Guys, I'm going to read New American Standard Bible. And also, for all of you who love the King James, I'll read the King James. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 36. And this is the context about marriage, by the way. Paul is talking about what do do Christians do in light of their present crises? If Christians are under attack and they're being imprisoned or being burned alive or crucified or fed to the lions, is it better for them not to get married lest they have wives and children that they expose to danger? What do you say, Paul, in light of our tribulation? Should we remain celibate? This is Paul's answer by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Guys, pay attention. 1 Corinthians 7, 36. But if any man thinks that he's acting unbecomingly toward his virgin, meaning preventing her from getting married, because he thinks it's more ideal for her not to get married. If any man thinks that, if she has passed her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes, and he does not sin, let her marry. Let me repeat that part again, David. If she has passed her youth, let her get married. Uh, uh, Muslims would salivate to find such a statement in the Quran to defend their filthy <laughs> pedophilic religion. But I'm going to read the King James for those of you who like the King James. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. David, remember, I said I'm not the sharpest tool in the set, uh, shed. If someone says, if this young girl is now past the, her youth, 
past the age of the flower of her age. What does that imply? Definitely sounds like she's grown up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she can't be a youth. She can't be prepubescent. She must be at an age past her youth, beyond the flower of age, and where she's physically and psychologically mature for marriage and having a family. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 36. Anyway. Oh, this is this is funny stuff, guys. Uh, right here. Um, all right, guys. I haven't seen a response from ex Christian. Let me know if he posts one because I'm, I'll be glad to po post it up here. But I, I have had oh. several other comments. Uh, we have Dale Dale Lee Tooley says the most powerful evidence is Muhammad prophesied in the Bible and world religious scriptures. So that's uh, that's the most persuasive argument for Muhammad. Now, Sam, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but according to both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and by, by, by the way, oh my goodness, I can't even believe this. Look at this. Yeah. Look at this. Okay. <laughs> We've got two comments, but, and you, you'll see the insanity of Islam. You'll see both the insanity and the deception of Islam, ladies and gentlemen, right here. Notice the top comment from Dale, Dale Lee to Lee. The most powerful evidence is Muhammad prophesied in the Bible and world religious scriptures. That's the comment on the top of the screen. Look at the comment on the bottom of the screen. Dale Lee to Lee. Allah's apostle, Allah, has told you that the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, changed their scripture and distorted it. <laughs> oh, boy. This, yeah, this guy's a troll. He's been like this for years. He stalks your comment yeah, section it, and mine. It, it's He's fine. That, yeah, they went yeah, ahead yeah. and blocked him because it's so obvious. But, guys, look at this. The most powerful evidence is Muhammad prophesied in the Bible. Top comment. Yeah. Bottom comment. Your scriptures have been corrupted. <laughs> this yeah. is the insanity of Islam. That's the most, the powerful, most powerful evidence for Islam, ladies and gentlemen. The most powerful is that he's in your Bible. Why does our Bible contradict and say he's, he's a false prophet? Because your Bible's been corrupted, ladies and gentlemen. Surprise, David. <laughs> and notice, notice that notice the deception. By the way, he doesn't point out. He doesn't point out that this is Ibn Abbas saying this about the Bible, and that we have other passages showing that this can't be what Ibn that the way Muslims interpret this can't be what Ibn Abbas actually means because Ibn Abbas affirms that no one can corrupt our scriptures, right? And notice that, so he'll leave all of that out, leave all of that discussion out, and then use this to trump what his God and his prophet say. His God and his prophet say that we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. No one can change it. No one can corrupt it. We still have to judge by it. We have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon our scriptures. Uh, let me go ahead and give you a quote by Ibn Abbas, which can't possibly be what Ibn Abbas meant. And let me just leave Ibn Abbas all about, uh, uh, completely out of it, so you'll think that it's Muhammad speaking. Or you'll think it's God speaking or something, right? And we even addressed wow. that in our rebuttals, yeah. our thorough reputation. <laughs> We've been through all this. Guys, well, can you go back? Muslims, please, go back. At least watch the discussions and the videos that David has done addressing these topics. Listen to the arguments. And then come back and say, you brought this argument. Here's why it's wrong. But don't simply repeat the same point that we've refuted over and over again. Try to at least engage our actual refutation, right? They can't, notice they never do. They keep bringing up the same stuff that's been refuted, and they claim to be the people of truth who are defending their truth. Guys, the truth does not need these kinds of, of methods to, to defend it. It doesn't. It doesn't need you lying about your own passages. It doesn't need you lying about your own God. It doesn't need you lying about anything. doesn't need that. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Someone was saying that ex-Christian Lee, he's not responding. It's not ex-Christian Lee. Guys. His only question now was, why are Christians leaving Christianity? See, he's got nothing to say. He's wasting time. Guys. Even one brother said, we want to hear Muhammad being God. These trolls are distracting. Ex-Christian, so, I can only conclude that you're lying. I'm sitting here. Yes. Yep. Giving you an opportunity. You're getting one last chance. Post what you regard as the most powerful persuasive argument for Islam. You said you're a convert to Islam. Give Islam. us the most powerful, most persuasive argument you have for Islam, the argument that convinced you that Islam is true. If you post anything else, guys, mods just block him. We don't have we don't have time for this, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, guys, we don't have time when someone's when someone's in the chat and someone is making a claim, there are times when we'll just slow down and stop and say, okay, we're, we're going to give you. Yeah. If, if we do that and the person will not even respond and just goes on posting the same nonsense, we do not have time for that. Uh, go, ahead and block, go ahead and block that person. Um, all right. And what do we have? We have, oh my goodness. What happened now? I'm looking at a comment from Nadim Ahmed here. He says, you yeah, will not yeah. talk about corruption of Bible. We yeah, How many it's, shows it's did we just do? Guys, this is yeah, so dumb. So this, this is, guys... What does your religion do to your ability to think? We spent 
Show after show after show. We even played clips from Ahmed Didat where he's going, is it 66 books? Is it 73 books? We went, we went, what? <laughs> it's so pathetic and sad, right? It's, we can sit there and do five live streams all on one topic. As soon as we address a different topic, they say, ha ha, you'll never talk about that other topic that you just did four or five live streams on. This is so incredibly pathetic. What does this religion do to a person's ability to hold a coherent, to call, to hold a coherent thought? We will, we will literally stop a program and say, hey, you just said you converted to Islam because of the evidence. Great. Give us, give us an example. And the person will just go off on some tangent. It doesn't matter what topic we talk about. They say, talk about this other thing. What is this? Guys, I'm talking to you Muslims. What does this religion do to your ability to hold anything remotely resembling a coherent thought? And if this is what your religion does to your ability to think, why should we not avoid it like the plague? Amen. You, you, Amen. What, what, what we see here, ladies and gentlemen, is, hey, everyone needs to convert to our religion. As soon as you do, you will completely lose the ability to hold a coherent thought. But do it anyway. No. If there was a, guys, if there was a button, right? If I said, look, here's a button. Push this button and you'll lose the ability to think. Don't push the button. Do no, I would not push that button for anything, but that's what you're telling us to do with your religion. This is amazing stuff. What an amazing religion. <laughs> yeah, they, then they, they can tire you out. On all, all, all honesty, when you hear the Muslims repeat the same script that's been decimated, then what, what it comes down to, folks, if it's the same Muslim, remember Matthew 7, verse 6. This is for the Christians here. Matthew 7, verse 6. Keep this in mind. Keep it in your heart. And ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment when to walk away. It says, do not give what is sacred to uh -huh. dogs or cast pearl before swine, lest they trample them underfoot. So there's a time in which you're wasting your time because mm -hmm. they're going to constantly blaspheme, mock, insult God and his word. And so you don't want to give them that opportunity. So you just ignore them. Let God deal with them. Let the Holy Spirit convict them. You've done your part. Move on because these guys are a complete waste of time. They are proof of demonization. They are proof that they're demonized. They are proof they're under satanic influence, and they're blinded by the devil. Um, yeah, I have to disagree, Sam. I think they are useful sometimes because they prove what, yeah. what what you just said. <laughs> they help us prove it, right? Like they're yeah. Because they, here, here's here's the thing, and here here's why we kind of here's why we kind of go with it a lot, right? There are there are Muslims who are sitting back and watching this, and they're trying to learn, and they see their defenders come on and just create a mess wherever they go. And they're watching this and they're going, wait a minute, these guys are quoting sources. They're going to the sources. They're quoting the Quran. They're quoting the Hadith. They're quoting the Bible. They're quoting all this stuff. They're giving evidence for everything they believe. And then our guys do nothing but try to be a distraction and bring up a bunch of complete nonsense that totally contradicts our own God and our own prophet. And they look at that and they go, wow. What it, what does my religion do? Why can't my, why can't the, Why can't my religion be defended with truth and honesty. Why can't my religion be defended like that? Because because guys, look, those of you in the chat, have you seen anyone here defending Islam without lying? Show me show me someone here who's defending Islam without lying. I'd like to see it. Uh, Sam, we have a uh, we have a quick uh, little side comment here, but he's been asking yeah. it over and over again. Uh, yes, this this I is this is another one. This is another one. That we've been through a bunch of times and apparently Simon is new here. He says, David and Sam yeah. need your help. When Jesus said in the New Testament, may your will be done and Father yeah. forgive them. Who is he talking to yeah. since Jesus is God? Is he talking to himself and why? Simon, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce it. We're Trinitarians, not Unitarians. If you're a Unitarian, I that's agree. Right. That's not going to make any sense. If you're a Trinitarian, what do you get, Sam? Yeah. No, here's what I want to say to Simon. Obviously, if he's asking because he's a Christian, let this be a lesson for all Christians here. Guys. The most important thing you can do is to know your faith. It doesn't help you guys just to know how to refute Islam. You need to refute Islam, but you need to know your faith because we want Muslims to get saved. Yes, it's better for a Muslim to leave Islam, but still, without Jesus, they're still going to face a Christless eternity because atheist, agnostic, anyone who rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ will stand before Jesus in judgment because the reason why creation exists, the reason why we exist is for the glory and the pleasure and the love of Jesus because we were created to love Jesus and be loved by him. Our true meaning, our true value, our true significance comes in worshiping the one who loves us so that we can be flooded in his love, peace and joy, <clears throat> a love that defies understanding. So let me again encourage Simon and everyone else. Spend more time studying your faith and knowing it 
before you go and venture to attack Islam, we need Muslim to be refuted. We need Muhammad to be exposed, but you want to also know the gospel because you don't get Muslims saved from hell by proving Islam is false. You get them saved by then showing them a better way, the only way, Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way and the truth and the life. This is a basic question that anyone who is studying his Bible and studying the apologetic material or has a good Bible teacher <clears throat> discipling him or her would know the answer to. What's the problem with Jesus saying, not my will, but your will be done, when we do not believe Jesus is the Father? We are not Unitarians, as David said. We are Trinitarians, meaning the one eternal God is eternally the Father, his eternal Son, Jesus, and his eternal Spirit. They are not the same self. They're not the same person. There are three distinct persons, three eternal relationships that exist eternally as one God. Since Jesus is not the Father, he can speak to the Father and the Father speak to him. Since the Holy Spirit is not the Father and he's not the Son, he can speak to the Father and the Son and the Father and the Son can speak to the Spirit and send the Spirit and tell the Spirit what to teach the church. And this is John 16, 12 to 13. So what's the problem with Jesus speaking to the Father, praying to the Father, saying, not my will, but your will be done, when Jesus is a distinct person, and that's all it's showing. My will meaning, I'm a distinct person from the Father, but I'm perfectly united to the Father, and can only act in union with the Father, and I'm one with the Father in essence, though I'm a different person. See, Simon, you would know all this if you take the time to study your faith. And if you come to my channel, I'm not trying to emphasize my channel. You can. If you go, you can go to YouTube, I'm sorry, you can go to Acts 17, listen to Anthony Rogers' series. He's done a series on Acts 17 Apologetics on the Trinity, especially the Trinity Old Testament. My YouTube channel is devoted entirely to defending the core doctrines of the Christian faith. Over 90% of stuff I do has to do with Christian doctrines such as the Trinity. Study your faith so you can know how to answer this. So again, let me repeat, I'm not saying don't refute Islam. We need more people to destroy Islam atheism, agnosticism, and all these other false ideologies, but we have to then replace it with something better. The better way, the only way, Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So study your faith to have something to offer them when they see Muhammad as a fraud, a son of Satan. All right, here you have, uh, you're getting stumped here based on uh, you just talking about the Trinity, Sam. You have uh, Nadim, Nadim Ahmed, uh, king of the cut and paste. Uh, go and make disciples. Uh, he says, original, go and make disciples of all nation in my name, Bible. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit. You have any clue what what this guy's talking about here? <laughs> I think uh, what he's referring to there is no there is no genuine Bible because you can have a counterfeit like you have translations of the Quran that Muslims say are are yeah. deceitful and deceptive. He may be reading some Bible that says in my he, name, he's not. He's cutting and pasting. He's cutting okay, and he's so, cutting and pasting. So what I think he was trying to say, yeah. but he didn't say it in a clear, articulate manner because again. He's trying to follow Muhammad and being illiterate and simply parroting things he doesn't understand because even earlier he made this silly comment. Muhammad mm -hmm. ended racism, racism and and slavery. Yeah, okay. Now, <laughs> what I think wait, he's wait. Saying, Muhammad yeah. Muhammad who bought, owned, sold and traded black African slaves black and had slaves. sex slaves and had sex with his slave girls, that Muhammad ended slavery? And That's and, right, and, appar racism. and apparently his followers didn't know that because they continued to enslave people. Up until down to the present, it was John F. Kennedy who had to force Saudi Arabia to end slavery. Wow. All right, go ahead, Sam. Okay, now, I think, I don't know, because he doesn't know what he's talking about either. He's referring to the fact that supposedly in the New Testament, guys, now watch. Watch how this is going to backfire against mm -hmm. Muhammad. If I understand what he's saying, again, because he's incoherent, he sounds mm -hmm. like the Quran, so he's yeah. imitating the Quran's incoherent babble. He's, he's, if he, I understand he's, what he's, he's saying. He's way more coherent than the Quran, and we still can't figure out what he's yeah. saying. Thank you. If I understand what he's saying, he's saying that though Jesus in Matthew 28, 19, right, says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son, Holy Spirit. What you find in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Acts, is the repeated exhortation to unbelievers 
to repent and be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. For example, Acts 2.38. I think that's what he means. I got so he said, you see? He, he added uh, various church fathers. He said various church fathers quated. Yeah, no, various church true. fathers quated the Matthews 28.19, where is Trinity? No, no, yeah. See, again, he's parroting arguments he doesn't understand because he's not intelligent yeah. enough to understand. Can I make the argument for him? Because the yeah, guy is a make, Yeah, make it like you would make it. Okay. Here's what he's trying to say, and I've heard this from Jamal Badawi. Yeah. They say that Eusebius, the church historian, right, mm -hmm. who wrote a history of the church before the Council of Nicaea, when he mentions Jesus' commandment to baptize, he says, go baptize them in my name. Yeah. This is what he's referring to. This is what he's referring to. Mm -hmm. Now, guys, again, don't take my word for it. Guys, yeah, I, yeah I, I just, I just, I just want to clarify. So, Eusebius quotes, uh, he quotes Jesus as saying, "Baptize in my name." So the Muslims take this and they say, "Oh, that's that's the original earlier one," and so that doesn't include Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, you see, Bible's been corrupted, and therefore Allah and Muhammad are wrong because Allah and Muhammad confirmed the. Bible that Christians had in the seventh century, which certainly included Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's one Allah and Muhammad are, are confirming, and therefore Allah and Muhammad are wrong. But Sam, why is this argument stupid? Yes. Now understand what he's trying to get at, folks. Mm -hmm. There was no Trinitarian baptism. That was a later insertion. Forget the fact that you have church fathers before Eusebius, and I'll list a few. You have the Didache. The Didache, and by the way, again, you're going to think like I'm trying to sell my website. I have several articles on Matthew 28, 19 and the baptismal formula. I have articles where I refute this nonsense on answering Islam blog, answering Islam blog .wordpress .com, answering Islam blog .wordpress .com, and answering Islam .net, specifically, specifically in response to Jamal Badawi, because J Jamal Badawi was one of the first Muslims I heard bringing up this objection. Okay, now what is the objection? Hey, uh. Eusebius, when he quotes the Gospel of Matthew, says Jesus said, baptize in my name. Now forget the fact, folks, you have documents, and this is in my response to Badawi and others. Didache, let me tell you why the Didache is important. For you Christians, this is your history, learn it. See, this is where the Catholics, the Orthodox, and the other churches that claim apostolic succession have an advantage over us. They do value the testimony of the church fathers. Not saying everyone's an expert, but we cannot ignore our spiritual forebears. The Didache is believed to be a manual that may have been written during the lifetime of the apostles, because some dated in the first century around 70 AD. If that is the dating, that means this document is written by the very disciples of the apostles, and the Didache is a manual on how Christians are to live. It even tells you how many times to say the Lord's Prayer a day. It says three times. It tells you how to baptize. In the Didache, if you go to the Didache and you read the Didache, here it is, chapter 7. Remember, this is possibly first century. Even scholars who don't believe it's first century say at the start of the second century, where the disciples of the apostles were still alive, right? Now notice, this is chapter 7 of the Didache, okay? Concerning baptism, baptized this way, having first said all these things, baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living water. But if you have no living water, baptize into other water. And if you cannot do so in cold water, do so in warm. But if you have neither, pour out water three times upon the head into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What? Here you have maybe a first century document, no later than the start of the second century, showing what the practice of the disciples of the apostles were. You baptize in running water. If you don't have it, find other means. But... Make sure you do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and Holy Spirit. Second point, the same Eusebius that he cited, though he does quote the Matthean version where Jesus says, baptize in my name, this is a fact of the church fathers, and don't take my word for it. At times, the church fathers would either quote from memory or they would sum up, summarize, and give you the gist of what's in the New Testament. Why? Because they didn't have the luxury of carrying the books of the Bible with them where they went, because remember, this is prior to the printing press. They didn't have mass-produced Bibles that they can condense in one volume and you carry around, so they would have to leave the codices or the scrolls in the church, and so if someone's at home and he wants to quote something from Isaiah, he doesn't go to the church and unfold the scroll or open the codex. He quotes it from memory. But the same Eusebius does quote the Matthean version as, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and Holy Spirit. He quotes both. 
-hmm. So then what does that mean? That means Eusebius at times is giving you the gist, and then other times he's giving you the exact formulation. And we have fathers before Eusebius, like the Didache, Justin Martyr, and others that show that what Jesus said, as accurately recorded by Matthew, is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. And there's not a single copy of Matthew, not a single copy of Matthew that has that baptismal formula, that does not include in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. So uh, just to recap here, everyone pay attention because we've, po we've pointed out um, that no one can defend Islam here without deception. And th the deception is not always uh, intentional. Uh, Nadim here, he might be just completely ignorant and has no, no clue what he's talking about. He's just cutting and pasting, cutting and pasting, cutting and pasting. Follow the reasoning here. So his argument is Eusebius centuries after the time of Jesus, he quotes Jesus as saying, um, go and make disciples of all nations in my name. Aha, so that's Eusebius there. So therefore, when the gospel, the first century gospel of Matthew says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that must be a later corruption after Eusebius. As Sam points out, Eusebius quotes both versions. Sometimes he's giving you the gist of it, and sometimes he's giving you the actual quotation. Notice you have both versions in Eusebius, right? He uh, uh, Nadim here, because he's just copying and pasting, he goes with the one where he just says my name and uses that to show that the Bible's been corrupted and you can't trust the Bible, all in a live stream that has nothing to do with this. Guys, what is this religion? What is this religion? My goodness. I can't. There's, there's, there's no such thing as a, as a coherent thought in this religion. There's no such thing as a good, rational argument in this religion. All, all you ever get is misrepresentation, deception, ignorance, distortion. That's all you get. And we're sitting here pausing. We're sitting here pausing for these guys. Look at this. Hey Sam, here's a different one. Here's Riddle Factory again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just to, just to get onto a different topic, and then we, we just we just have to play the clip uh, from from Adnan Rashid and and actually uh, address. Yeah. I guess we're gonna have to do a part two then tomorrow. Got one. Yes, yeah, no problem. Riddle Factory says, Prophet. So this is his proof that Muhammad's not a pervert who's obsessed with a little girl. Riddle Factory says, Prophet married Khadija, who was 15 years older than him and was widowed twice, while Prophet was a virgin, and during their 25 years relationship, he did not married again. All right, so your your evidence that Muhammad was not a pervert and a freak, Riddle Factory, is that he married a much older, very rich woman, and that's yeah. the, that is the proof of the purity of his motives, right? Because so so everyone everyone keep in mind if you see if you see a young man marry a much older widow who's filthy rich, that's that's proof of his pure intentions. <laughs> And when she's the actual breadwinner and she's the rich one and he stays with her and doesn't go out and marry a bunch of a bunch of other uh, women and girls, that's proof that his motives are pure as the driven snow. And it's not because he understands, wait, she's the rich one and uh, I better I, I, I better stay yeah. in line. And then as soon as she dies, you start marrying women and girls left and right and doing every perverted thing you can think of and, and boning every slave girl you can come yeah, up with you. and stuff. Sure. And then you just go buck wild as soon as she dies. Guys, this is the proof that Muhammad is 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 pure of heart. And by the way, by the way, there, there, there are other issues here. Guys, Muhammad marrying Khadija. I did a series, The Psychology of Islam. That's how right. messed up this guy was, figure. how messed up this guy was that his mother died. And what does he do when he gets married? He marries a, a woman who's the same age his mother would have been. This guy was all kinds of messed up, Sam. This is like one of the most, yeah, this guy, right. there should be, there should Mommy be massive issues. textbook issues of this guy's, of this guy's psychological disorders. Anyway. All right. Yeah, yeah. Should we yeah. go ahead and watch the, <laughs> watch the Adnan yeah, clip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. By the grace of God. Let's do it, folks. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Here, here's, now we're going to show Muhammad is God. Yeah, here's the plan. We're, we're going to show that uh, according to Islam, uh, Muhammad is God. And what we're going to do, we're going to show you just a clip. This will be an example. Then tomorrow, we'll, we'll, we will ignore distractions tomorrow. And we will focus on how the various ways Muslims deify Muhammad. So we'll go ahead and play this clip. We'll, we'll show what they do. And then we'll we'll just take some uh, we'll, we'll go through the super chats because I know there there's there's some, there there were a lot of super chats earlier and we'll go through the super chats and then we'll 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 call it a day till tomorrow. All right, here we go. 
We have the mighty Adnan Rashid. So this is from the same videos we were responding to, but we went through his, went through all of his arguments that were actually relevant to what we're, we we're talking about. But now what Adnan was claiming was that uh, the Quran isn't affirming the text that we have, even though it says it, it is. And even though Muhammad said, he said, he says that we have the Torah and the gospel. Adnan is saying that the Quran is only affirming parts of what we have, remnants and how we find those remnants is we look for things that line up with Islam. And so he gave the example of Surah 7, verse 157, saying that, that Christians and Jews find Muhammad mentioned in the Gospel and the Torah. And so Anan wants to say that the Quran is affirming these prophecies about Muhammad. Now watch how he deifies his own prophet here. It is clearly stated that People of the scripture, the Jews and Christians, can find Muhammad mentioned with them in the Torah and Injil. They find him mentioned with them in the Torah and the Gospel. So here it is clear that when God tells the people of the Gospel to judge by what he has revealed therein with that important caveat, he's talking about the passages that have been confirmed by the Quran as true revelations to Jesus and Moses. So it is very clear. All right, Sam, I want to go ahead and keep this up on the screen. But we have here, I'm going to leave this up on the screen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. We've been through this over and over and yes. over again. It is a complete, utter, total joke to think that this is about Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's clearly, if you read the context, it's talking about fellow Jews, that this, this is a person from the fellow Jews. Um, later in the book of Deuteronomy, they explain what this, what this phrase, prophet like you, means in context. It referred to Moses' miracles and having a face-to-face -face intimacy with God that does not apply to Muhammad. Therefore, Muhammad is not the prophet like Moses. And apart from all of that, just two verses later, in Deuteronomy 18.20, we have two criteria of a false prophet who would have been executed. And it says if he fabricates a revelation, if he, if he gives a revelation that doesn't come from God, or if he speaks in the names of other gods, that prophet would die. Moses would have stoned him to death. Muhammad did both with the satanic verses. So this passage, which according to Adnan, Allah is affirming as the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, this, using this passage, Muhammad would have been stoned to death as a false prophet. So that's, we, we can lay that one aside. We've dealt with that over and over and over again. Sam, I want to take a look at this Deuteronomy 33.2. 33, right? Yeah. Yes, right. So notice, notice, and he even puts, even puts Lord in all caps here. So Adnan knows what this is saying. Adnan knows what this is saying. But this is a common, a common passage that Muslims go to. It's one of several passages that Muslims go to. And he's also going to bring up, he's also going to bring up uh, the, the Holy Spirit passage which is also deifying Muhammad, but Deuteronomy 33, 2. Notice what happens here, ladies and gentlemen. Adnan puts this on the screen, claiming that this is a prophecy about Muhammad. Muslims use this regularly. He said, <laughs> let's go and read it. He said, the Lord came from Sinai, Egypt, and dawned over them from Seir, Palestine. He shone forth from Mount Paran, Arabia. Notice he's putting Egypt, Palestine, and Arabia in parentheses because those aren't in the text. He came with myriads of his holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. Now, what do Muslims say about this? They say, you see, this refers to three prophets, Sinai, that's, that's Moses, Palestine, that's Jesus, and Arabia, that's Muhammad. And myriads of holy ones, this, this refers to Muhammad coming with lots of soldiers when he conquered Mecca. And all of that is wonderful, as long as you ignore that it's the Lord, capital, and Adnan, right. Adnan knows, but we know that lots of Muslims here don't know this. Lord in all caps in the Old Testament. If you're reading an English translation of the Old Testament, and you see Lord in all caps. That means that it's Yahweh, right? It's 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 Yahweh is the subject there. Uh, there's no yes. way to translate Yahweh, so you put it as Lord. But this is the God of Scripture. It's God came from Sinai. Was coming. God, yeah. Uh, from Seir and from Mount Paran. And so Adnan has just deified not only Muhammad, but also Moses and Jesus. We would agree with them on the Jesus part, but as for the Moses and Muhammad part, we're going to have a little problem. Sam, yes, what's, what, what's going on here? 
Yeah, folks, if you read Deuteronomy carefully in its context, the context of Deuteronomy as well as the four the four books that preceded, because we believe Moses, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the bulk of it, and we believe that another inspired prophet would have written his obituary and included it as the finale to Deuteronomy. It's not saying God will raise up a prophet from Palestine, Jesus, and a prophet from Arabia, Muhammad. If you just let the Pentateuch speak in context, it's talking about the places in which the Israelites sojourn and that God was with them with his myriads. And I'm going to show you that the myriads means angels, not jihadis, you know, Muslims who are fighting in the cause of Allah. Fisa bil Allah. He's talking about God coming down with his heavenly hosts, his angels, because the word myriads is used of the host of heaven, accompanying God when God is about to do something smashing, something miraculous, something earth shattering. Let me prove it to you. The three places are the pl three places that the Israelites sojourned in the wilderness. They're all in the wilderness. This all took place during 40 years in the wilderness. Here, let me just read the references. Numbers 10, verses 11 to 13. On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the testimony. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. Okay, They set out this, this first time at the Lord's command through Moses. So did you see that? Sinai. And what did you have? Paran. Now Deuteronomy 1, 41-46, for the sake of time, I can give you more references. I'm just going to give you one more. Okay, Deuteronomy 1, 41-46, here. I'm going to go to the relevant part. He says, the Amorites who lived in those hills came out against you. They chased you like a swarm of bees and beat you down from Seir all the way to Hormah. Seir, this is talking about the battle between the Israelites and the Ammonites that didn't take place in the future when Jesus showed up. This is taking place in the wilderness, Seir, all the way to Hormah. And you know what? Let me just give one more, just one more. Deuteronomy 1, verses 1 to 2. Deuteronomy 1, verses 1 to 2. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the desert east of the Jordan, that is in the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophel, Lebanon, Hazaroth, Dizahab. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by Mount Seir. There are the three mountains, Mount Seir, Mount Paran, Mount Sinai. It's referring to the mounts that the Israelites came to in their 40 year sojourning in the desert, accompanied by God and his holy ones, the angels. And it is referring to God himself. How do I know? Guys, again, I want you to write these verses down. I'm trying to be as in-depth as possible without belaboring the point. Read Exodus chapter 19. Guys, write this down. Exodus chapter 19, verses 9 to 24. Specifically, Exodus 19, 9, verse 11, and then 16 to 24. Read Exodus chapter 33, verses 7 to 11. Read Numbers chapter 10, verse 34. And also read Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 38. There you're going to see it says that God appeared in a pillar of cloud that looked like a pillar of fire by night. The Israelites saw the cloud, because if you read earlier in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 13, verses 21, 22, and Exodus 14, 19, all the way to 28, it says that was the cloud that kept Pharaoh and his armies from getting near Israel to slaughter them, because the cloud stood between them, and at night it appeared as a pillar of fire. And it's in that cloud that God descended on Mount Horeb, and the Israelites heard God's voice audibly, knowing here is God. He's now in our midst, in the cloud, accompanying us. And if you want proof that the myriads do not refer to jihadis but angels, guys, write this down. Psalm 68, verse 17. Psalm 68, verse 17 and 18. Psalm 68, verse 17 and 18. Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. Okay, write these down. Acts 7, verse 53. Acts 7, verse 53, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. I'm even getting tired, but Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, Hebrews 12, 22, and finally, Revelation 5, verse 11. There you're going to see that the angelic hosts are said to be myriads, tens of thousands, 
and it says that the angels accompanied God when he came to give the law through Moses. So it is Jehovah, Yahweh, and his angels who were there, sojourning with his lights from Mount Sinai, Mount Seir, Mount Paran. It has nothing to do about Jesus or Muhammad. It is recapping their experience in the wilderness where God and the angels accompanied them. What else do you want? All right, Sam, well, up on the screen, I have uh, Donald Trump here, who is actually not the Donald Trump. He is a Muslim who uh, is further confirmation that they cannot respond to anything without having no clue what we're talking about or deceiving. He says, Deadwood exposed. There's no such thing as capital or lowercase in Hebrew or Greek or Arabic liar. <laughs> Donald Trump, do you agree that there is such a thing as capitalization in English? That's what I said. See, Lord there in all caps. Let me repeat, and I'll say it extra slow for you. In the Hebrew, there is a word, Yahweh, which refers to the covenant God of Israel who created the universe, right? That God gives his name as Yahweh. There is no English translation for the word Yahweh, so, when the English translators write that name, they put Lord. However, there are other words that are translated as Lord, right? So, in order to show which word they're talking about, i.e., if they're talking about Yahweh, they put the word Lord in all caps to show that's the word that they're translating. So, when we see the word Lord... In all caps, that tells you that the word is Yahweh. Does everyone here, besides Donald Trump, because I know he still doesn't understand it, does everyone else understand that? And even if you're a three-year-old, don't you understand what I just said? I'm saying that because, watch, Donald Trump is not going to understand anything I just said. you got to be nine years old, David. Come on. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, just to be clear, Lord here is in all caps, Adnan, unlike Donald Trump, knows what that means. It means that Yahweh is the subject here. Yahweh, now let's just go ahead and, and include that. Yahweh came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir and shone forth from Mount Paran. And Adnan claims that this is about Muhammad. And, and it's not just him. Look at this. Yeah. Here we have Abdullah, Abdullah Aman. I, I can't tell if he's joking or serious, but I think before we started talking, Abdullah said, isn't Prophet Muhammad mentioned in Deuteronomy 33 too? Also yeah. Prophet Musa and Isa. So he's, 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 referring yeah. to, he's referring to Isa. So he says, this is a hard text to avoid. So if he's not just joking, then he's claiming that that Surah, I mean, that, that, that uh, chapter 33, verse 2 of Deuteronomy is about Moses and Jesus and Muhammad. Now, guys, it's it says Lord. It specifically says Lord. It's talking about the Lord. The Lord dawned over them from Seir, and they say yeah. that's Jesus. <laughs> well, the Lord. One thing I'll, the Lord. I get, oh, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. So, no, I was going to say this man actually. He's been very open because he told me he's been rocked at the core of his faith. Oh yeah. So he's really. That's why he's simply trying to get the best arguments of Muslims refuted because this is something that Jamal Badawi made famous. Yeah. But I can tell you, he's been following us and even admitted to me that his, his faith is being very challenged. In fact, he just complimented me. He said, Shamunin, you are so talented in my, our response. So he is open, but he's seeing, okay, what do you do with this? But now he saw we decimated it. So Abdullah Aman, Aman what's left? The best arguments of your apologists are being shattered before your eyes because Abdullah, it's not because I'm smart or I'm a genius. It's because Jesus is real. Jesus is alive. He is the son of God. The Bible is his word. And if you go against him, you will lose. He is the stone that if it falls upon you, it will crush you. But if you fall upon it, it will break you. And we're hoping that it will break your pride and enable you to be humble to say, yes, Jesus, you're the son of God, my Lord and Savior. I renounce Muhammad. Stop kicking against the goads. Christ is risen. Muhammad is dead. Turn to Jesus, your Lord and Savior. Now, we, we might want to uh, return to that. Um... Oh, but this Muslim stumped you. Amzusa said, it said, Lord, you idiot. Can't you read it? It said, Lord, you idiot. Is that what he said? Yeah, he does. Amzusa. 
<laughs> guys, guys, you <laughs> hold on. Did he say that? Because yeah, you, yeah, you, you yeah. can't make this stuff up if they still don't if they still don't get it. If you cannot understand anything we just said, that in Hebrew there's a word Yahweh that refers to the one true God. And that when they, there, since there's no translation of Yahweh, when translators put that word in there, they put Lord in all caps. If he still does not get that and he's calling us stupid, then this is some hilarious, hilarious stuff. Um, and just to bless your heart, look what Abdelaman said to our answers. He says, I've never encountered this type of arguments. Well, what does he mean? The Muslim arguments or? No, our, us. No, yeah, fine. yeah. He, he, has, he has to have encountered the, uh, the Muslim arguments because he gave it. Yeah. All right, so um, so guys, look, and, and by the way, Sam, um, and we'll we'll probably uh, we'll probably go to some super chats now and, ch and check out the uh, comments in the super chat, but we'll we'll probably review this point tomorrow and then go on to the other because they did it again. They do it again with the the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is clearly divine in John fourteen through sixteen, and they say that's Muhammad, and they're deifying Muhammad again there. But Sam, even with this, Muslims do the same thing with Habakkuk three three. Right. Let me read Habakkuk 3.3, 3, because Muslims do the exact same thing. Let me read that here. There it just says God. It just says God. Habakkuk 3.3, 3, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Right. Muslims will quote just the first part. God came from Teman. God came from Teman. They'll say the Holy One from Mount Paran. You see, Muhammad's the Holy One from Mount Paran. This is about God. This is about God. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. And they'll say it's about Muhammad. Right? Yes. They they do they do this they do the same thing with the the their so their so-called prophecy in Isaiah. I've already done a video where they take a, a verse that specifically says Yahweh is a man of war. They take the word Yahweh off of there and they say it's it's about Muhammad. Guys, yeah. Muslim apologists over and over, very popular Muslim apologists. Jamal Badawi, Adnan Rashid, yep. um, the, 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 the most popular Muslim channel on the planet, right? They take these passages that are clearly and indisputably about God. They take God out and they insert Muhammad in there. And this is supposed to be the religion of pure monotheism that does not, does not associate yep. any partner with God. What in the name of common sense is going on here? This is demonic, man. This whole thing, this whole system is demonic at its core. Go ahead, Sam. But it gets, it gets worse, folks. I don't know if you've ever heard Jamal Badawi say this. And he misquotes the Bible <clears throat> dictionaries and encyclopedias. They say, you see, God rose from Timan, uh, and that's in Medina. <laughs> Here's where the deception is. God, I've heard Jamal Badawi. I've, I've had a response to this. Badawi is so deceitful and dishonest. He quotes <clears throat> a source talking about Tema, Tema, which is an oasis in Medina. And then he pulls a fast one and says that Timan is Tema. Timan is not Taima. Look at any Bible dictionary. Look where Timan is. It is nowhere in Medina. He deliberately switched the term Timan for Taima in order to deceive Muslims in thinking that Timan is Taima. Taima is an oasis in Medina, but that's not what Habakkuk is referring to. He's not referring to Taima. He's referring to Timan. Do you see the wicked, deceitful liar Jamal Badawi and his ilk happen to be? All right. So, uh, guys, we're going to continue because there is actually a lot to cover on the issue of uh, Muslims deifying Muhammad. And this is just one example, but we'll, we'll have to go through. We'll, we'll go through some more showing that they take they take all these passages that are about the, the God of Scripture and they say, yep, that's about Muhammad. And their ignorant listeners don't realize what they're doing. And then their listeners go around saying, yep, th th this verse about is about Muhammad and it's about God. I don't even realize what they're what they're doing. Uh, it's, it's really, really sad. I've pointed out. So we've pointed out that that the Muslims who are actually defending Muhammad, defending, uh, defending the Quran, defending Allah here and attacking the Bible. When have you seen them do it without misrepresenting or distorting something here tonight? Right. Exactly. The, the, the only ones who are being honest are, are the ones who are kind of uh, are a little bit shaken and they're actually they, they seem like they're actually listening and paying attention. The others are just trying to distract. Right. And if you notice, this goes all the way up to their top apologists. It goes all the way up. Right. It's not. So, so notice, just be clear. You can have Christians who don't know what they're talking about and they go on and they, 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 they're, they're spouting a bunch of nonsense and they don't realize it. Right. It, if you go up to the Christian scholars, they're not just they're not just lying in order to deceive people. Right. In Christianity, you would be called out for that. You would be exposed. You would be embarrassed and you would be you would no one would pay any attention to you anymore. In Islam, it's like the more you lie to the people, the more popular you become. 
I mean, Nabil, Nabil, yeah. Nabil put together a video. He he went through a five minute clip of Zucker Nike and found 25 errors, factual errors in five minutes. Zucker Nike speaks for five minutes and he's committing an, he's committing an error on average every 12 seconds. This is amazing stuff. And, and he's, and that's the most popular. All right. And now, by the way, before you go to super chats, guys, mm -hmm. just to confirm what I said, this is my response to Jamal Badawi. I just popped it up. Okay. Now don't take my word for it. Jamal Badawi's lecture is online on YouTube, Muhammad in the Bible. And here he quotes Jay Hastings' Dictionary of the Bible, and he confuses Timan with Tema. Now here, here's what the same source that he misquoted said. Timan, a tribe and district of Edom. That's page 897. Okay, page 897. Now on the same page, it mentions Tema, which is what Badawi was trying to say Habakkuk 3.3 is referring to. It's not. It's Tema. Now Tema, Genesis 25.15, 1 Chronicles 7.30, a son of Ishmael. The country and people meant are still represented by the same name. Modern Tema, a large oasis about 200 miles southeast of the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, and the same distance due north of Medina in West Arabia. Do you see the dishonesty of this Muslim who masquerades as a scholar? Habakkuk says Timan, right, a district of Edom. And Edom are descendants of Asa that settled in Syria. And then he says, you see? God is going to show up in Medina because Timon, Tema, Tema, one of the sons of Ishmael, Tema, an oasis near Medina. This dishonesty shows that the same spirit that influenced Muhammad, as David just said, is the same spirit working in these people. The father lies and a murderer, and they need Jesus to set them free. Um, Turb, Turb says, uh, so going through the super chats, uh, most, I'll start with the most recent. Uh, Turb says uh abdullah aman's biggest problem is that he is think he is thinking it's logically impossible for god to enter creation as a baby he denies that allah entered creation in a fire too please respond and help he denies that allah mm -hmm. entered creation in a fire there you're just contradicting your your quran yeah. um clear as, but, clear as day. yeah let, let, me, let me go and let me go and uh uh, respond to the first part of that so he thinks it's logically impossible for god to enter creation as a baby um Abdullah, no, it's not. There's no contradiction involved. If if God wants to enter creation, he can do it. In fact, if you go with anything like re remotely resembling uh, Salafi Islam, God is actually a, a physical being somewhere, right? He has a he has a body. He's he has he has a location. That's why you have in the Hadith that God actually has to come down to the lowest heaven to hear prayers and stuff. He has exactly. a, he has a physical location. So. I don't know why you're 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 thinking of God in a very non-Islamic way if you think that he uh, he couldn't enter creation in a physical form. We would view God as all powerful. If God wants to take on flesh, God could take on flesh. God could do that like it's nothing. If God wants to ride a bike, right? <laughs> that would normally mm -hmm. be something that that you know physical beings. If God wanted to ride a bike, God could take on a form and ride a bike. That's true according to the Old Testament. It's true according to the New Testament. Notice in the opening chapters of Genesis, what God walks around. God walks around. Now, according to the Bible, he's also the omnipresent creator of everything. God is everywhere, and yet he can he could come down, take on a form, and walk around. So in 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 both Judaism and Christianity, if God wants to God if God wants to come down and walk around, he can do that like it's easy. In Islam, God can do it as well. God walks around. He's he looks exactly like Adam. He's 60 feet tall and so on. Um mm -hmm. you you Sam, don't, aren't there even There's Muslim stars? 60 cubits, right? Hmm? Yeah. Uh, aren't it's a 60, that's 90 feet tall. 60 cubits, 90 yeah. feet tall. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay, yeah. 90, so he's 90 feet tall. And Sam, yes. don't, don't we don't we even know that that like when 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 God made Adam, Satan couldn't tell the difference. So Satan had to yeah. had to crawl in through his mouth. Go through him. Yeah. Crawl through him and then crawl out his crawl out his butt and realize that it's not Allah, it's Adam. So that they were they were completely yeah. I, completely identical. So um yep. so uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Abdullah, what religion you're following, but it's not Islam. And in Christianity, if God wants to enter creation, He can do that. He He has the power. Go ahead, Sam. No, yeah, actually, you addressed everything. I mean, you mentioned Him, Allah descending, at the third part of the lower heaven, right? I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, at the third part of the night. That's right, third yeah. part of the mm -hmm. night, in the lowest heaven, and ask who's it's supplicating me. Mm -hmm. And then clearly, the Quran says Allah was in the fire. Yeah. That was in the tree that didn't consume the tree. I mean, what else? Yeah. You, you, blessed you, is, you pretty much touched on it. Yeah. yeah. Blessed is he who is in the fire and those who are around the fire, right? So, yeah. And, and that's and, chapter and then he, and 27, then... verses 7 to 9. 
It says, blessed is he who's in the fire and the one who's about the fire. Well, the one who's around the fire was Moses. Mm -hmm. Who in the world is in the fire? Can the Muslims at least answer that? Yeah. And then, and then he says, he speaks out of the fire, Moses, I'm Allah. <laughs> yeah, I don't, he does. I don't know right. how he can make it any clearer. Right? Look, this is something that you see in, in uh, among Muslims. They get this theology in their heads, and it completely contradicts the theology of the Quran. And then they end up with a theology that completely rejects the Quran. You, you guys, you can't you can't do that. If Allah says he's in the fire and he speaks out of the fire, then he's in the fire. Why would you reject him being in being in the fire? Yeah, right. if they want me, if, if that's gonna, I just want to read it for them if they want. Here it is, twenty-seven, seven to nine. So when he came to it, meaning the tree that had a fire that didn't consume it, he was called blessed. Is he was in the fire, in the fire, he was about it. Glory be to God, the Lord of all being. Moses, behold, it is I, Allah, the Almighty, the All Wise. But according to them, that's actually Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, let's go through some more. Uh, Ricard Hispanarium Rex says, "Thank you for your work, guys. God bless you." Mira Susie says, Revelation 16, 13, Muhammad in the Bible, Muslims. So let me go ahead and read uh, Revelation 16, 13 for everyone. She says, this is the prophecy about Muhammad. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouse, mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. I have to say that is much, much clearer uh, than any of the prophecies Muslims go to that are supposedly about Muhammad. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Ambrose gives the thumbs up. Uh, Satu Jamsaja says Jesus loves us. Amen. Bob Tom says the Shroud of Turin. There is nothing that can scientifically prove how the image can appear. Divine intervention. Look it up. I actually have uh, in my resurrection series uh, one of those videos, which is an interview with Gary Habermas, who Next has written multiple it, yeah. books on the Shroud of Turin. So uh, that'll be coming up, Bob Tom. Marilyn Murphy says, do not cast pearls before swine. Swine equals not halal. Isn't it ironic, don't you think? Sure. Uh, John Cass sure. says, Adnan, are you now using <laughs> Adnan? I think he's talking about Adnan Rashid. Adnan, are you now using the pseudonym pseudonym X Christian? So I think he's asking if it's Adnan <laughs> appearing as X Christian. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, Ricard Hispanarium Rex uh, also says, Guys, I'm considering starting a channel refuting Islam. I'm a Christian and feel as though God is calling me. Any advice? Thank you and God bless you. I actually did a live stream maybe like 10 days ago where it was me and Vocab and John. And we were talking about advice for people who want to get started on YouTube. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, Ricard, I would say watch videos that you like. Um, come up with, uh, modify everything to come up with your yes. own style. Um, you don't need to worry too much about equipment. Try to get a good, but you can even use like a cell phone nowadays and record videos on it. Try to get somewhat of a good mic, but you can get a mic for like 20 bucks that'll plug into your phone and you can have good enough audio and good enough video and then practice and then don't give up because that first year to two years is called your pain period. It's called your pain period among among actual, you know, YouTubers who've been doing it for a while. It's called your pain period because it sucks. It sucks. You'll spend, you can spend a lot of time making a video and then, you know, you get 20 views on it or something like that. And it's easy to get discouraged and think, oh, my stuff's just not taking off. When you got to realize it takes time. It takes time to, to build up uh, a YouTube following. If, if you go back to any of the popular YouTubers and you go back to their original videos, their original videos sucked. Their original videos stuck. The, the, they, they, they suck. The, the difference between them and the people who gave up is that they didn't give up. They kept doing it and kept improving and kept getting better and kept growing. All right, so uh, Rory, Rory Husky, 1988, has posted a, a bunch of comments there. He says, I mean, reason answers. He made a video on Muslims worshiping Muhammad. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I might have to check that out. Uh, Rory Husky also says, D. Wood, I recommend Reason Apologetics. He made a new video on this. Okay, so on Muslims worshiping Muhammad. Yeah, we might check that out. But we've got tons of, yeah, we got tons of stuff on this. I think that's uh, William Albrecht, my friend. I think I know that's what it is. Mm -hmm. But go ahead. Uh, believed on him believed on him says uh, brothers I pray that all of your wonderful work never stops being Amen. effectual against Satan and for God the scripture cannot be broken and Jesus is the only mediator yeah we, we, we hope that too I know that you know there are people who think we're really awesome we happen to know how much we suck so it's cool because we're all yeah. we always have that concern right like yeah, like uh, like it. all the all of us all the guys who work together we're all like we're all like messed up do so it's always in our heads it's always in our heads you know we could we could screw up at any time here so hopefully hopefully by the grace of god we uh we don't uh, and i can tell him hey he's not lying by the way he's yeah. actually 100 percent right we're a bunch of misfits and my fear at least is that i shame the lord and discredit myself and i don't want to shame him so i beg jesus to protect us so he's not joking about what he's saying here yeah. 
Um, Catherine Schoonover says you are doing the Lord's work. Uh, Gene Fortes with the uh, bird in the, the uh, super sticker. Michael M. says, hello, David and Sam. Just wanted to present a few Muslim claims real quick. Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. So this is, he's not giving the, the case for Muhammad here. It says Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, because the word prophet is used to describe Jesus, mm -hmm. that it means he can only be a prophet and not God. Yeah, yeah that's easy to refute. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> Here's what's ironic. Who, and what was the brother's name that asked that question? That's Michael. Michael M. Oh, okay, now Michael M. Please pay attention because I want you to see this. Here's what's ironic. Yes, Jesus is a prophet because he's truly human and he's the greatest of all prophets because he's the only perfect sinless prophet that perfectly worshipped, loved, and adored his father <clears throat> on earth and continues to do so. But here's what's ironic about that assertion. And the reason why... <clears throat> You'll find God stating this about Moses because Moses is going to point to a greater reality that, that happens to be more than human, happens to be God in the flesh. Folks, don't take my word for it. Go to Exodus 7, verse 1. Pay attention, Michael. God says to Moses, now, depending on the translation you read, it may translate it like God or a God. He says, literally, I will make you Elohim to Pharaoh. I will make you Elohim to Pharaoh. Notice what God says, I will make you God to Pharaoh, Elohim. Now we know Moses is not God in nature. He's God functionally. He stands in the place of God. He represents God and speaks with God's authority. But isn't it ironic that Moses is called God and he's a prophet as a picture of the one who is a prophet and truly God in the flesh? So he doesn't simply represent God. He is God in the flesh, much greater than Moses, though similar to Moses. So that doesn't refute us, it actually proves our point, because Moses is called God, because he represents God as a prophet, and Jesus is God in essence, who as a man represents the Father. Yeah, guys, um, the, the, biblically a prophet is someone who speaks to people on, on behalf of God, and if, if, if the divine son enters creation and speaks to people on behalf of God, he, he's a prophet. Jesus is... He's everything, right? He's he's uh, he's uh, he's all of he serves all of the the major roles: prophet, priest, king, lord, all of that. God. Um, all right, well, guys, there there are some more super chats I wanted to get to, but I need to be off this right now yes, because uh, my wife has to get on the computer. She has a discussion. Right. She has to get to. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna cut this off here. And Tomorrow, no, it's the same time, right? God willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 4 p.m. So on weekends, uh, this is this isn't necessarily permanent, but you know, for as long as we can, we're going to try and go live uh, on the weekends sure. earlier in the day, so Europeans uh, Europeans can watch. Not just Europeans, basically anyone anyone who's in a kind of different time zone from from uh, from what we normally do. And so make sure to tell them I want to see 1800 tomorrow, and God willing. Two hours from now. Two hours, I'm going live on my channel. Two hours from now, in Jesus' name, and I want to see 1800 tomorrow. Okay, so that's it. All right, so Sam is going live in two hours. The link to his channel is in the description box, and so definitely check that out and be back tomorrow, same time, and we'll probably jump right in tomorrow onto the topic of Muslims deifying their prophet. If you learn, if you learn that, ladies and gentlemen. It's ball game. We, we we talk about ball game in different ways. Like if you know, since the Quran affirms the Bible, then the Quran self destructs. We talk about things like that. Uh, but I mean, what Muslims really regard as their bread and butter is that they are the religion of pure monotheism. If you can actually show that they are saturated in idolatry and man worship, you're going to lead them out of Islam. So learn the material. All right, catch everyone tomorrow. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.